It's probably safe to say that the response to the Fat Shark HDO was not what Fat Shark would have hoped. A lot of people, myself included, were a little bit disappointed that some of the complaints that we've had for a long time seemed to have gone ignored. So when Fat Shark said, hey, do you want to come out to China and interview our CEO and see our factory? And I, I said yes. And that's what we're going to see in this video. I'm Greg French, I, a.k.a. Fat Shark, as you may know me better. I am the founder of Fat Shark. How long ago did you make your first set of FPV goggles? First set of FPV goggles, um, uh, it's a VR flyer, as a, as a French Canadian guy. And uh, he was, you could almost say, the, the, the founding father of FPV. And he had made a little airplane, um, put a little guy in it and head tracker and, and uh, put it up on an airplane, flew over a golf course. And it was the first time somebody actually saw what, what could be done from a guy, you know, on, on the ground flying an airplane FPV. So I put uh, some, you know, grabbed a camera and a transmitter and basically duct taped it to a car bought a pair of uh, or escape video goggles was kind of flip up display ones at the time they're quite popular and uh, it was very frustrating experience it was fun for like 10 seconds until something stopped working and the sort of light went off as a you know typical engineer go how can I solve this problem you were defining a market I mean this the first product I built was a complete flop I sold like 50 units maybe uh, the reason was I made it too cheap I was an FPV, I was an RC car guy, and I'm like, nobody wants to pay more than 100 bucks or 150 bucks for a system. So I put the cheapest, lowest resolution display I could put into it, and, uh, and uh, then I find out that, well, people put, you know, guys are flying airplanes, want to, are willing to pay a little more, they want a higher resolution system. So right here, we can see the, the, the beginning of the values that brought Fat Shark to where they are today. The desire to make a product that gives people a good experience, not a frustrating experience. And well, I mean, he said it himself, I made my first product too cheap. He doesn't wanna make that mistake again, maybe to the detriment of you know Fat Shark's position in the market, who knows? Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about whether Fat Shark goggles are too expensive or whether they should be cheaper. But Greg's position certainly is that they are the right price for what he's giving you. And um, yeah, but why can't, what about that power button? For 500 bucks, can we get a power button? <laughs> the next place I wanna go is, to, uh, we, I, want, I wanna look at the manufacturing and assembly and the quality control process. Um, to be honest, I have never been in a facility like this before. I'm willing to bet a lot of you haven't. Um, so let's take a look. Okay. Uh, what should I say? <laughs> well, Anything you like. Right now they're trying to assemble the um, HDO. Uh, and we will have our job order. And plus, you know, they're going to do exactly the job based on the SOP. And what are they checking here? Oh, uh, they actually have a checklist. Yeah. They're going to check first, you know, uh, the image was best defined and also the nerve and also the accessory parcel there. I mean, the MPQ for this cartoon is 20 pieces. When I finish the packaging 20 pieces, we're going to scan them one by one and then combine those uh, 20 pieces together and then regenerate it in new QR code. And then we stick them uh, outside the box to make sure that this batch actually contains those 20 pieces. Well, the reason why you do that is if there is a, let's say there's a run of components or we get um, customer reports of a failure, you can trace the QR code to trace the lot number of the chipsets right. in case you get like bad resistors or something and then if you want to communicate to your customers, you can say, hey, scan your QR code. Oh, you're in an affected batch. I'm Alan Evans, and I'm the CEO of Fat Shark. I, so after all our headsets are assembled, but before they're put in boxes, 100% of them come in here. This is where we do testing. So this is our QC evaluation room. Yeah, so we test everything, including color, alignment, stereopsis, sort of all the things you'd want to test. And we do that so that every headset is consistently consistent. So if you, if you buy a Fat Shark headset, like an HD3, it'll look the same as another HD3 is another HD3. And so one of the problems you sometimes get is reviewers will often get early units, but I could hand build 100 headsets, 20 of them would be beautiful. 
And so I could just look through and find the 20 of them that were beautiful. And this was one of the first things that I was overwhelmed by when I was doing other headset manufacturing that Greg had already figured out. And he figured it out by looking at 10 to 20,000 headsets and bidding them based on problems and then going in to analyze them and then rebuild test equipment to go find all that analysis. So if you look over here, you'll see a white and a pink carrier. Everything that is passing goes in a white carrier. At any point anything fails QC, any of our tests, it goes to a pink carrier. And then what we do is we take all of these and we go figure out why they failed, group them why we, they failed, and then generally rework them until they pass. How long uh, does it take to build a thousand? Uh, two days. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Two days, yeah, wow. but only for assembling. But for testing, burning those, all the process is going to take one week. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We, yeah. do about, we can do about a thousand weeks. Right. Wow. They test uh, you know, a lot of functions. They have their SOP. Um, Space space, testing all the right. buttons, testing the AVM, testing the mixture, all that works. The camera on top goes to the test pattern. The next thing I did is interview Alan Evans, the CEO, and his area of expertise is consumer electronics, and that's what he brings to the table at Fat Shark. Before this, I was the founder of a company called Avagant, and I really was into headsets. Went through, spent a couple years where I was in China 100 nights a year working in different cities, and that's how we started our relationship. And after seeing 40 or 50 different factories, I'd walk in here, and it was really amazing, actually, the caliber of production and the caliber of process they had. It's pretty amazing because building headsets is really hard. Uh, so the first thing that's hard is the ergonomic fit. So if you, you buy glasses, you wear glasses, right? You have a certain temple width, you have a certain distance from your ears forward, you have a certain eye spacing, IPD. Yours is different than mine. And so the variance in people's head sizes and head shapes is actually really big. Why can't we have a wider IPD? If you do a wider IPD, you make the shell wider, and then you change the temple width to accommodate it. it. Generally on the narrower part, you have the optics modules, and there's a collision point. So, um, you know, we've looked at this in a bunch of different ways with a bunch of different products. You would have to start to do small, medium, large. So it's really interesting for us, for example, the, the Sony OLEDs that we use in the HDO, they're a 5,000 piece buy which means other competitors have to commit, or we have to commit, to 5,000 pieces just to ship the first one. And so then to do different variations on the plastics, on the toolings, all that sort of stuff, we, you still have to hit those minimum order quantities. And the FPV market just isn't big enough at the premium end to see those quantities. And so we'd rather try to work on one unit that works for as many people as possible to keep the price down. You know, my design philosophy is with on this product line has always been about, you know, number one, performance, and, and number two, reliability. And any time you do a radical design change, you're throwing a whole bunch of new elements, untested elements in there that may or may not cause a problem. Yeah, but li literally all our R&D and work was basically, let's get that display as, as good as we can, keep what's safe, and if that works, maybe we can take that and roll that into a next generation headset. Since you talked about doing extensive re research, when you really release a product, you know it's gonna be right, I gotta bring up the question about the, the line at the bottom of the HDOs, because a lot of people are gonna hear you say that, and they're gonna go, well, you released the HDOs, and on day one they had this problem. You wanna talk about that? How did that happen? I guess it was missed. It did exist on our uh, products we shipped out, and I think it got missed because it only shows up in certain uh, startup sequences. This also ties back to your other question, is why didn't we make all these changes? And you have a perfect example of, we basically only changed the display, new display technology, we, and we had it in the field, it was tested and else, and even that one change had an issue that everybody missed, and it becomes a recall, so. So there it is. There's the answer to your question. Why can't we have a freaking power button? Why can't we have the fan balance lead uh, change to be integrated into the goggles? And the answer is that Fat Shark does not want to risk introducing a bug or an error and it compromises the quality and performance of the goggles that they're making by, by making that change. Could they make the change? Yes. I mean, surely they have clearly a very sophisticated manufacturing system. They're clearly capable of saying, we're going to change this to put the power button in. But 
I think what it comes down to is that's not a priority. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I really feel like that's true. That's just not where Greg specifically feels like he wants to put his energy. He wants to put his energy into making the goggles look as good as possible. He wants to put his energy into making sure that people who come into the hobby have a good first experience. I think you see that, especially if you look at the Fat Shark 101, which is Fat Shark's intro drone FPV kit. The, the design philosophy that drives through it is the desire to have somebody have a good first experience and to remove all of the little impediments that get in the way of that. And I gotta say, I mean, I, I really appreciate that. I see a lot of people, I help a lot of people who are very, very frustrated. They have so many people say, I'm not kidding. Literally, so many people say, I am about to throw this stuff out the window, sell it, and never look at this hobby again because they're having such a frustrating time. And, and I certainly respect the desire to make a product that is going to give people a good first experience. On the other hand, I know a lot of people were like, well, can't we have that and a power button? And the answer from Fat Shark is, not today. And what, now you know, you don't have to wonder. They know you want a power button or whatever it is, the balance lead and the fan and yada, yada, yada. They know you want that stuff. They haven't done it today. It wasn't a priority for the HDO. It might be a priority at some point in the future to talk a little bit about what's coming next. But anyway, there, there you go. The next question that I asked was, why are Fat Shirt goggles so expensive? I mean, I can buy an Oculus Rift with giant screens for you know 1080p for 600 bucks, fat sharks for 500 bucks. So there are people who feel like they're overpriced for what they are. First, the Oculus Rift does not make money on hardware sales. They sell to make money on software. The second reason is the most consumer electronics companies are doing millions of units. So sort of every zero you add to the number that you buy, you get a little bit of a price break. If in fact our margins are so big and juicy, then Chinese clones would be half the price, but they're not. Yeah. I, th I think just by the, by the competition out there and the other product offerings, you can, it's been determined that we, are, we price appropriately. All the companies in FPV all are profit-driven companies. And that creates kind of an interesting circumstance that I think uh, people don't really understand. When you run a company like ours, like Immersion RC, several of them, you need to put in working capital to buy products, as I said before, 5,000 pieces. So you figure, let's even assume it's 100 bucks, right? Okay, that's 50 grand just in working capital. You have to do development. So you have to pay engineers, you have to have facilities, and you put all this cash out. Six months later, you come around and you build a product. And then you have to start to sell that product. A lot of times, if that product has a recall or is not maybe super successful in the market or anything else, you have to be able to weather that storm. And so when you look at how a lot of businesses run, they, they go through these ups and downs, but that's part of the margin calculation for companies that invest in R&D. And that's one of the things I meant when I had said, hey, you know, if you really want to support continued development here, new interesting things, you want to pick the companies that make themselves healthy enough to continue to exist. Right, that's how we can still fix goggles from five years ago. And when it comes to the cost of Fat Shark goggles and them being overpriced, I gotta say, I agree. And I, I, on, I it's not like I went out to China and, and drank the Kool-Aid. I have, been, have said this many times before, you can look at my comment history. Fat Shark goggles are not overpriced because if you look at the competition, whenever a goggle comes into market that is much cheaper, it's also significantly worse. Yashin EV100 is a great example. And whenever a goggle comes to market that is even remotely similar in quality to Fat Sharks, it's always about the same price, 300, 350 bucks. Look at the Elmway Commander V2s. They are, go look it up, $440 for the Elmway Commander V2s. So, and I don't think that's a case of just, well, everybody's just getting gouged and nobody wants it. Because what does China do? China doesn't gouge, China undercuts. China undercuts and makes it up on cheap labor and margins. They'll make twice as much profit on a goggle that costs 75% or half as much. If a Chinese company sells a freaking FPV goggle for $350, by golly, you know that's the fair price 
for that freaking cockle it can't get much cheaper right now i mean i think it's it's kind of unfortunate is that you know it's great that there's a lot of chinese products on the market that are inexpensive and you can get into fpv for you know 70 bucks for a pair of goggles and a quad and a radio the unfortunate side of it is their their first experience well, often ends up being very frustrating. They get a pair of goggles that they can't focus on. They get a quad that they can't bind. They get something that crashes and it's done. And they're like, I'm out. You know, and obviously like, wait, wait. No, this is a fun community. This is, this is a really fun sport. Don't go away. We want you. We want to grow this. But, you know, so by offering, you know, if we can come up with some products that are obviously you don't need to undercut them, but, you know, that are more in the price, you know, the premium brand of of the of the uh, introductory stuff so people would be like okay well this is fat check i heard about them um it's a few dollars more not much more and but they heard the quality is good and they get it and their first experience is click oh yeah the image oh it's all working oh, this is great fantastic oh yeah and then they then, then they just forget about it and go fly and have fun i hope that i struck the right balance between asking the questions that you guys asked me to ask and uh you know still showing the message that fat shark well you know it's a two-way street here so if i go there and i ask the questions that, that everybody wants asked at the same time fat shark gives you know they want to present themselves and have you guys get to know their point of view better and i hope i've done both of those things it's really challenging uh it's really challenging to, to do that so i hope i've done a good job of it let me know what you think down in the comments I know some of you are never going to be convinced and don't want Fat Shark. Some of you aggressively hate Fat Shark. You can talk about that in the comments too. But if this gave you any insight, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear that my 16-hour flight to China was not for nothing. <laughs> I got to eat some good food. Thank you guys for watching. Happy flying.